everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody once again to our panel from the Republican Governors Association. This is, of course, part of the McCluskey Speaker Series, so thank you, Tom and Bonnie. It's also <laughs> Fred Malik helps put this together. Thank you, Fred and Marlene, for all you do. Uh, what I plan to do is ask a few quick questions of each of the governors uh, here, and then maybe a couple questions for the whole panel, but then open it up to everybody here to ask questions. And if I may, I'm going to start with Governor Ducey, uh, partly because he's an Aspen Fellow, an Aspen Rodell Fellow. And so thank you for that, Governor Ducey, also because you're newly elected and uh, 23rd Governor of the State of Arizona, and you were just sworn in this year. So as a newbie, we're going to make you go first, if you don't mind, sir. And Governor Haley, you've been here so often, we'll let, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to, you're a businessman, and I wanted to know, in fact, so, uh, three out of four of you have been in business. I wanted to know how being in business impacted the way uh, you run a state. Well, uh, thank you, Walter, and it's, it's great to be here. I am part of the Aspen Rodell Foundation, although I've never been here in the summertime. Uh, what, boy, what a beautiful time of year to be here. Uh, my background is in business. Uh, my company was Cold Stone Creamery, uh, the ice cream company. There's free ice cream outside for everybody. Thank you. And, and, and what I found is you get a lot of undeserved popularity when you're selling ice cream. Uh, and that all goes away when you balance a budget. <laughs> but I, I think what I would say, what I've, uh, I'm, I'm certainly learning a lot about government. I'm learning a lot about public policy. But when I'm in a pickle or trying to find the way forward, I really rely on what I learned in the private sector as a chief executive. The idea of, of setting a vision, uh, laying a plan out that charts the course, and then picking the right people on your team, both internally and externally, isn't really a lot different than what we had to do to move programs through Cold Stone Creamery. I mean, we started out with a, a, a handful of stores in Tempe, Arizona, and grew to 1,440 stores in all 50 states. Uh, so to work through a legislature, a House, and a Senate, and the different constituencies in a broad coalition, uh, those are a lot of the things that I had to do in the private sector, and I try to think in that same way uh, and, and know that communication is always the most important thing as you're trying to move good ideas forward. And you forward. just talked about a broad coalition. You've been known really for reaching uh, towards the middle on some of the issues, including on one of the controversial issues for many governors, which is Medicaid expansion, and you decided to go ahead and do that. Why was that? I, I've been clear that I have believed that Obamacare is a, a rolling disaster and a monumental failure, and it's been something I've been 100% against. Uh, my predecessor made a decision. Uh, this is Jan Brewer. Yes, b before I, I came into office, and what we're doing is working as hard as we can to take charge of programs inside the state while at the same time curb the overreach of the federal government. Mm -hmm. But I believe not only the politics and policy that we want to move forward and what I believe is what we want to do with the reputation of the state of Arizona to demonstrate that we're the most business friendly state in the country, the best place to live, work, play, recreate, and retire. But we also want to have a government that works on behalf of its people and the people that count on these government services. So we're focusing, I mean, we've got 42 separate agency heads, 220 boards and commissions, and we want to make sure that these programs roll out properly. I would like to see, and we will ask for different waivers so that we can have charge over those dollars. In other I words, on the Medicaid, uh, Medicare ex Medicaid expansion dollars. Yeah, th and that's been, been done before mm -hmm. we came into office, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll put our fingerprints on, on how we deal with that going forward. And uh, you also tried to, I think, um, move away from some of the hot button social issues, including even, if I'm correct, overturning a ban on gay adoption, as if that shouldn't be something that 
governor should worry about now. Is that part of the broad coalition strategy? What, what we had was an agency had that overturned a, a regulation, and what we wanted it was just how it was when we came into office. Right. Uh, but we have stayed very focused on growing the economy. We've stayed very focused on K-12 education. I don't think of those as partisan issues, Walter. And uh, we came into office with a $1 billion deficit in our state budget. And what I didn't want to be is like other elected leaders who I don't particularly care for, who point fingers at their predecessors or make excuses or kick the can down the road. I thought I was a chief executive. I ran for the office of chief executive. We're going to own this budget, and we're going to fix this problem. And you just mentioned K through 12. That'll be my last question. What are you doing to focus on K through 12 and change the system? Well, we have a, we're going to have a bold reform package for K through 12. The first thing we did is in this really brutal budget where we had to make tough decisions, we protected K-12 funding. We also have some ideas where we can bring additional resources to K-12 by better leveraging our permanent land endowment trust fund next year, so we'll be able to do that without raising taxes. But we want to do something called a, the Arizona Public School Achievement District, I really believe that the biggest difference inside these schools, the ones that perform versus those that don't, are a principal, a leader, who's making personnel decisions. So an achievement district will have like charter schools as well as? Well, they're, all, they're both public schools, yeah. charters and, and traditional mm -hmm. K-12s. Mm -hmm. So my job is for all the kids in all the public schools. The achievement tr district is to take the schools that are excelling and allow them to share best practices practices mm -hmm. with the schools that need help. Get those principles to teach those attributes to those schools. And then we've got a really Byzantine funding formulas. They were written in the 1980s before some of the innovations we enjoy today. We're going to go through all, all those funding formulas and have ones that are more equitable and are as close to what we would call backpack funding following the child because we believe in, in uh, school choice in Arizona and we have open enrollment. Great. Governor Mary Fallon of Oklahoma, thank you for being here for the first time. And uh, you have instituted something called performance-informed budgeting uh, and spending. Explain how that works. Well, thank you all. It's a great pleasure to be here. And actually, I've been here six times, just not on this stage. But oh, okay. It's always a pleasure to be here, and we appreciate Fred all the... Fred picks who gets to be on stage, so if you talk Fred, to him... Fred, you know what? We appreciate all the Aspen Institute does, but thank you for asking about performance-informed budgeting. You know, one of the biggest challenges that governors have to deal with, and frankly, I wish our Washington colleagues would deal better with, is how do we make sure that we're funding things that work in state government versus things we just hope will work, but things that will actually have measured performance? And so one of the things that we introduced in the state of Oklahoma, and we worked with the Pew Foundation to be able to do this, is to have what we call performance-informed budgeting. In other words, we outlined five specific areas that we wanted to make improvement to, um, health, education, safety, government accountability, and jobs and economy. And then we looked at all of our funding in our state because there's always more need than what you have of funds. And of course, when you have a little bit of an economic downturn with the energy sector, then you really have to really hone down on where you're spending your money and what your priorities are and, and what you hope to accomplish in your government. And so we initiate this system and then we ask all of our state agencies in those five different categories, uh, focusing on those things, to set what we call metrics and to set goals and to have uh, performance driven goals and to be able to measure those and measure the outcomes. In other words, I told the Department of Education, okay, I wanna increase our number of high school graduates I want to increase the number of college graduates. So I want to re be able to make sure that our third graders are reading at grade appropriate level. And I want to measure that. And I want to measure whether you're doing better over next year than what you did the year before. On criminal justice, you know, we said we wanted to reduce recidivism. People who exit the criminal justice system and do we help them to stay out of the criminal justice system or do they come back? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's, it's some other area of, of just public health, like reducing substance abuse. and reducing infant mortality in the state. We're helping people find yeah. jobs, creating jobs well, opportunities. Well, speaking of jobs, you have kept unemployment lower than most other states. I think you're around four and a 4 half. 4.3. 4.3. 4 
Um, what new sectors of the economy have been growing, and how do you have a new economy in a state like Oklahoma? Well, one of the things we've done is focus on our strongest, best-paying industries in our state and to make sure that they have the quality, skilled workforce, educated workforce that they need. Is that oil and gas first? It's oil and gas, it's aerospace, it's manufacturing, mm -hmm. it's uh, transportation-related mm -hmm. services, it's um, health services in our state. Mm -hmm. and so we've worked with our Department of Commerce and with our superintendent of public education, our college presidents, our K-12 through superintendents, principals, and our career technology schools to really focus down on data as to what kind of workforce do we need in very specific regions of the state and to make sure that we have those skill sets. In other words, if we're producing a lot of um, uh, people that are graphic designers and I need computer technicians or I need mm -hmm. electrical engineers for the aerospace industry or maybe someone, petroleum engineer for the energy sector, how can I make sure that we're producing the type of skill sets needed for the employers in our state so they can grow and expand and create jobs. Um, unlike Governor Ducey and I think Governor Kasich, uh, who just announced, you have been very firm against Medicaid expansion. What are you going to do in the future uh, to try to you know, deal with those issues that come out of the Medicaid expansion debate? Well, I happen to be a member of Congress when we voted on the Affordable Health Care Act, and so I was very involved and knew a lot of the details of that. I didn't vote for it as a congresswoman, and like Governor Ducey, I, I think the Affordable Health Care Act has not turned out to be what was promised to the American public. Insurance premiums are going up. We've certainly seen a, a colossal amount of rules, regulations, and, and uh, people that are even not getting insurance because their premiums are going up. So what am I doing in the meantime? In the state of mm -hmm. Oklahoma, I'm creating jobs and good-paying jobs. Mm -hmm. So here's a, a good statistic for Oklahoma. Our uninsured rate in our state was 18% of our population. It has recently dropped to 13%. But it wasn't because of the Affordable Health Care Act. The reason it dropped by that large number was because we created better paying, more jobs in the state of Oklahoma. That's why we have a low unemployment rate. And we have grown at twice the national average in economic growth, in fact, we had the fourth fastest growing economy in the nation since 2011, and our per capita income has gone up double the national average in our state. So people are earning more, they're getting good paying jobs, they're focusing on work skills, education, aligning our, our uh, employers with the type of, of skills that are needed. And one last question, there was, uh, you had to go through what I assume was a painful situation on the execution of Clayton Lockett, where you know the drugs didn't work and other things, it became a big national issue. Tell me what you learned from that experience. And what he's referring to is, we had an inmate that was up for execution. It didn't go as quickly as what some people thought it should with the process itself. And so we're about problem, sol problem solving as governors. And so the first thing I did was I put together a task force to look to see what didn't quite go right in the process itself, because Oklahoma has a death penalty. It's the law of our state. And so I put together a task force. They did an investigation. They came back to me, gave me their recommendations. They recommended that we have a better training process for those who are following the law and, and going through the process, that we would also have a better facilities and that we would have better communication between those who are carrying out the process and those in, in law enforcement. We always have constant communication during that process with my office, which we did do. And uh, the question was how long it took. You know, and I guess that's a, a, an opinion that a person might have. Do you take 20 minutes? Do you take 30 minutes? And finally, um, the president actually, I think, just came to Oklahoma. I was just thinking of this he on did. the prison reform issue. And that's something that Democrats and Republicans and far left and far right even have worked together on recently, which is the question of over-incarceration. Do you feel that there's an over-incarceration problem? You know, one of the things we hear in our nation is that we have so much divisiveness in our nation between our, our different political parties, and people just want their problems solved. Mm -hmm. So this is actually one area that I think, I think we can find agreement on whether you're a Republican, Democrat, whichever your party you might be, 
maybe not on some issues in the criminal justice system, but I think we can agree that we have a lot of people who have substance abuse problems. We have a lot of families that lives are destroyed or too many children that go into state custody. We have broken marriages, poverty, people who don't finish their education because for some reason they may get into the criminal justice system. And so how can we be smart on crime but yet tough on crime? And so one of the things I've been working on in my state is to work with our criminal justice systems, our district attorneys, our judges, to work on looking at our people who are in our system and to look at especially substance abuse issues. And we know in the state of Oklahoma that we have a prescription drug abuse problem in our state, as many states do. And so this year I asked the legislature to pass a bill called the Prescription Monitoring Bill that basically doctors have to check on certain prescription drugs that are addictive pain pills before mm. they issue them and they have to check them at a certain period mm. of time. And hopefully that'll stop, start reducing the amount of drug abuse in our state for prescription drugs. Mm. So we've boosted our substance abuse funding in our state. We've been able to do what's called triage, to find out what the real reason is that someone's entering into the corrections facility. They have a substance abuse problem, they have a mental health problem. Are they someone that may be a veteran returning with PTSD? And what is the issue? Is working on drug courts, veterans courts, uh, mental health courts, triaging mm -hmm. those people to get them the right care. And for those who have a substance abuse issue, you know, my personal opinion is that for those who have an, it's a problem, they're not a criminal, but they have a problem, try to get them treatment, try to get them help, keep the family together, let them support their families, let them get back into society with treatment, with help, once they prove they're willing to do that and become productive citizens. Governor Pat McCrory, North Carolina. Good to see you again. Welcome back. It's great seeing you too. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you have described yourself sometimes as an Eisenhower Republican, or at least so I've read, and uh, you have a Republican state legislature, both houses, and sometimes you seem, uh, including this week, because they're in session, uh, getting into conflict with them. How do you see uh, your role in leading the Republican Party of North Carolina in overcoming some of the contentious issues in what is a purple state, generally, a state that can elect both Jesse Helms and John Edwards in the same breath? I think the major role of, uh, of the governors is to first create a vision for your state and how you want the state to look, not just next election, but for the next 25 years. Yeah. And from a uh, one thing, one reason I call myself an Eisenhower Republican is I'm a fan of his, not just because he was Allied commander of the U.S. of the Allied forces during World War II, but during his presidency, he did some incredible things, especially the highway interstate program. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I don't think our country is doing, and our state also needs to improve, because right now North Carolina is the ninth most populous state in the United States of America. And most people do not realize how large North Carolina is, not just geographically, but we have 9.6 million people there in major metropolitan areas. So as a mayor, I was mayor of Charlotte for 14 years. One thing I learned as a mayor, you can either anticipate growth or prepare for growth. And both in business and in politics, I feel the, the way you beat the competition is anticipating as opposed to preparing or reacting, um, as opposed to reacting. So and you think we have an infrastructure issue? Absolutely. I, I think we need an infrastructure program for the United States and for the state of North Carolina in order for us to compete in the future. And I've presented, just like I did as, I did in, as mayor, when Nikki Haley actually lived in my city. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I introduced a 25-year transportation plan for the city of Charlotte. And it's great when I go back home to Charlotte now, they're in the 21st year of that plan. And I go, wow, look at what we've done and how we've uh, uh, adapted to growth as opposed to reacting to growth. And I feel we need to do the same well, thing in the state of North Carolina. Why at the Carolina. federal level have we been unable to do things like uh, infrastructure the way we did in the 50s and 60s with everything from the internet to the interstate highways? I think one reason is where do you get the money? And there's a big dispute on where do you get the money? The gas tax revenue is going down because cars are getting more efficient and gas taxes are very politically unpopular for any politician, whether it be Republican or Democrat, because it's something that people actually see the price every day on the street. Uh, the second reason is where do you put the infrastructure? And there's debates between what region of the nation gets the infrastructure. And I'm having that same debate in North Carolina. And what I did in North Carolina was take the good old boy system out of where we put roads in North Carolina. We had a formula 
which basically, uh, you know, wherever the most powerful politician happened to live in our state was where the widest road happened to be, and it was always named after that politician. <laughs> it's very coincidental. And wherever I see the name of a politician on a road, I go, that must have been the majority leader or minority leader or the governor. And what I did was set up a formula in my first year as governor, and we're going to be building roads and rail based upon three basic criteria. The first criteria is congestion, where the cars are. Another criteria is where is the safety issues. And the third criteria is where can it improve economic development opportunities across the state and small towns and large cities alike. In fact, I'm proposing a $2.8 billion bond proposal that I'm working with the legislature on now to, uh, to invest in roads and infrastructure, our ports, our roads, our rail, our state parks, for the next 25 years. And I think it's our job as leaders to prepare our states for the next generation, not necessarily for the next election. Mm -hmm. There was a Wall Street Journal headline, which I have here, says North Carolina legislature tilts right while McCrory tries to chart a centrist path. Um, part of that tilting right seemed to be on hot button issues like uh, voter registration, making it harder to vote the same day, whatever. How do you feel about issues like that, that tend to be contentious and racially contentious, and how that affects uh, your ability to be a leader of the party at the state level? Well, again, as a governor, I want to focus on the main issues that the people are talking about. And those is the jobs, the economy, and education, and also infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we also have a major mental health issue that no one is talking about, and I'm so glad to see the governor talking about it because mental health and, and addiction is one of those issues that's costing us a lot of money, but we're sweeping the issue under the rug, and it's impacting families and communities throughout our country. But that's where I think as governors we need to focus on the issues. But we can't run away from the other interesting and often controversial issues because we have legislators that are the separate branch of government who often are interested in those subjects and frankly the media loves those subjects yeah. more than anyone else. They do complain you think about that them the but they love them because they like to see the car wreck. Do you think that um, polarization both in the media as well as in uh, the gerrymandering of districts has added to this problem? Uh, there's no doubt. I've even seen it since I was first elected mayor in 95 and I was elected governor in 2012 that the media has become very segregated. Uh, you know, we have our um, stations that appeal to African Americans. We have our radio and TV stations that appeal to women. We have our Spike TV that appeals, appeals to men. We have Fox that appeals to conservatives. We have MSNBC that appeals to liberals. And so we all listen to people we agree with and we become very monolithic and I think that's hurting our country. And the same thing's occurring with the gerrymandering of our districts. Uh, both the Republicans and uh, Democrats are very guilty of this. I do not have a solution for it, but the fact of the matter is as governors, we have to run statewide and appeal to everyone. Um, and in North Carolina, we have both metro major metropolitan areas and very small towns. We have the east, the west, and the central part of our state. And uh, I have to appeal to everyone where legislators, they're more worried about their primary opponent as opposed to any general election opponent. And that has changed the dynamic of politics both in Washington and in, in each of the state capitals. I think the governors would probably agree with that. <laughs> Governor Haley, welcome back. Good to see you again. Um, Governor McCoy just mentioned mental health issues. I was wondering, after the Charleston shootings, we heard many things, you know, whether it be about race and the flag, about gun control, but part of it was a mental health problem and mental health services. You've actually been doing a lot on that. Explain what you've been doing and whether the Charleston shooting has uh, helped provide more impetus to your work on that. Well, first of all, I think it's important for everybody to know that the um, murderer did not have a mental health issue. He mm. has no record of mental health. He is in perfect good health. This was a case of hate. It was straight mm. hate. Sorry, and, yeah. it, and we need to all be very aware of that. I will tell you that I have always had a part of me from the first time I came into office that has, um, that feels it's incredibly important that we deal with the mental health environment because you've got so many people that end up in emergency rooms or in jails because people don't know what to do with them. What we know is one in four people have a mental health issue. 
So look around. <laughs> However, <laughs> however, there is a however. She ha used to live in Charlotte. She moved to South Carolina. <laughs> However, if treated, they lead a perfectly normal life, and that's the key. So we have really focused in South Carolina on the mental health issues. In cities, you find that they get that treatment. In rural areas, they don't. So we have really revamped South Carolina to get into telepsychiatry. So now when someone comes in, we've got a doctor. He's just on a computer, and he's sitting there talking back and forth with the patient. So now South Carolinians, regardless of where you live, if you walk into an emergency room, we're not going to put you on a bed. We're not going to put you in jail. We're going to treat you, and we're going to send you home and make sure that you have follow-up so that you're well taken care of. Yeah, I uh, made a mistake, I guess, on the Dillon roof thinking it was a mental health health issue and you said it was a hate issue. You've been praised a lot for what I think the headlines were skill and grace at immediately dealing with the flag issue because being a Southern I know I grew up with the Confederate battle flag but that what it symbolizes has sort of changed and it became a symbol for a lot of people at least of hatred. Tell us about your thinking and how you stepped in right away because of that. So here you have um, a situation which I wouldn't wish on any governor. Um, you know, we always prepare for times of crisis. And, you know, in South Carolina, I was worried about the hurricane that may hit or, you know, something else that may happen. What we had was um, nine people on a Wednesday night that went to Bible study. And actually, it was, it was 11 people that went to Bible study. And they accepted someone that didn't look like them didn't act like them, and they accepted him and prayed with him for an hour. That love and acceptance was so powerful that it gave a grace to the families that when they were faced with the murder, they showed our state and our country what it meant to forgive. That forgiveness was so overwhelming that the compassion across the state of South Carolina and the compassion across this country hit a core we had not dealt with in a long time. So there weren't protests, there were vigils. There weren't arguments, there were hugs. And all of that compassion motivated people so much that there was action. And that is why last Friday, you saw the Confederate flag come out down off the state house grounds in South Carolina. Have you talked to the family of the victims and talked to them about what your act meant to them? So I, I have attended all of the funerals, and I want you to know that these were fantastic people. They are nine people that you would not know, um, but they're nine people now that I'm so thankful to know. It was um, someone like Cynthia Hurd, whose life motto was, be kinder than necessary. It was someone like Tywanza Sanders, who was our youngest victim. He was 26 years old and came up with a different thing he wanted to be every week. But he had just finished college, and he wanted to own his own barber shop. But on that day, he stood in front of his Aunt Susie, who was 87 years old, and he covered her. And his last words to the murderer were, you don't have to do this. We mean no harm to you. These are the people that we're talking about. So yes, I have dealt with all of the families. They make South Carolina so proud. The nine people remind us what love and acceptance looks like. The nine people reminded us that we need to focus on what really matters. Um, I hope that the story of South Carolina reminds all of you that what unites us is a lot more than what divides us. And we need to remember that as we go forward every day. Thank you. And I hadn't heard that phrase be kinder than necessary coming out of it. But I, I do hope that that uh, filters out as well. Thank you. Um, on uh, the economic issues, you've been remarkably successful, perhaps to the consternation of Governor McCrory, of taking BMW and Volvo and Boeing. How have you been able to attract big businesses and industries to the state? So I'm going to brag because I'm proud. Um, you know, in South Carolina, we are proud to say we build planes with Boeing. 
we now have three car companies, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Volvo. We have five tire companies, Bridgestone, Michelin, Continental, GT Tire, and we just added a Swedish car company. All, by the way, are non-union, which is something that we're incredibly, incredibly proud about. But real quickly, you talk about Volvo, right? Yes. Yeah, so did, we recently, um, we've recently brought over Volvo. And is, did you deal with it? It's owned by the Chinese, though. Now we right? only dealt with the Swedish okay. firm, and actually, the Chinese company were very hands off. Yeah. Um, but I was I'll just asking out of curiosity. Uh, that wasn't a pointed yeah. question. So you know what I'll tell you about this is in South Carolina, we focused on something that was very important. I didn't want jobs. I didn't want to just take them from other governors. I wanted made in America yes. jobs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it was easy, I was going to take it. But um, Ooh. <laughs> what we really did, for, what we did focus on was made in America jobs. You know, now I'm proud to say that we, we I partnered with Walmart um, a few years ago. I started talking to them. They decided to do this great program that was really going to focus on they wanted things in their stores that were made in America. And I said, I want to help you do that. And what you'll find is international companies are very scared to do business in America because they just don't know how it works. And so what we have done is we handhold them. And a lot of it has led to the fact we now have the first flat screen TVs made in South Carolina. We now do the bikes that Walmart was getting overseas. They're now doing here. You look at GT Tire. You look at all of our tire companies. They're all from different um, countries. And the way we have done it is whenever a company comes to South Carolina, Instead of thinking of it from South Carolina's perspective, you sit in the CEO's perspective, and you have to understand time is money, and they want to know that they're going to have a partner, and they want to know that you're going to take care of them, not just cut the ribbon at the celebration, but where are you going to be when there's a whisper of a union? Where are you going to be when there's over-regulations coming in from President Obama? Where are you going to be when it's time that they need a workforce? And so what we did was we found that the number one thing that companies care about right now is they want a good, loyal, trained workforce. How do we do that? We have a training program in South Carolina that the company, we ask them, you tell us what you want. We go to the country, we study their training, we learn what they want, we bring it back, we train the people ourselves, we turn them over to them, and we say, now you interview them. Our success rate is 97% that they hire. Mm -hmm. The difference that is also helpful is GT Tire, we train them in their culture. It's going to be within the, their culture. You go to Michelin, it's in their culture. You go to Volvo, it's going to be in the Swedish culture. So we train them not just in skills, we train, train, train them in culture so the CEOs feel very attached and they become part of the family. So it's a great success story mm. in South Carolina and we're going to keep doing it and I'm going to keep taking them from <laughs> you. So. You know, when I, uh, she helped me campaign for this, I ran for governor in 2008 and lost during the incredible President Obama election. In 12, Nikki came across the border to help me, and I said, Nikki, when I get elected governor, we're going to kick your tail. <laughs> and she said, may the best woman win. <laughs> I might add, however, I've got, Nikki and I have this all the time, we're great friends. We love competing against each other. We were, the, North Carolina was the highest unemployment, fifth highest unemployment rate in the country two and a half years ago. We're not even in the top 25 in unemployment. We're now in the 18th in employment. So we're making great progress. And she helps us do that, by the way, because it made us take our recruitment to a whole nother level. So what Texas and Georgia and Florida and uh, Nebraska and Arizona, we're all competing against we each compete, other. We compete, but we have a great time doing yeah. it. We do. That's and my final She's question before I though. open it up, but my final question to you, Governor Haley, is as a, a family of immigrants from India, um, how does that inform your thinking on the immigration debate, and what do you feel about the tone of the immigration debate as it's recently turned? So I think that what we have to remember, and I have always believed, is that we're a country of laws. That's what's made us strong. We have to always be a country of laws. So it's incredibly frustrating for a lot of people when they see the illegal immigrants being able to come across. It, it really is astonishing that after all these years, DC can't figure out how to build a wall. It really is after all of what they spend. Having said that, 
We are a country of immigrants. I am the proud daughter of Indian parents that reminded us every day how blessed we were to live in this country. They resent when people come here illegally. But let's keep in mind, these people that are wanting to come here, they want to come for a better life too. They have kids too. They have a heart too. They, so we don't need to be disrespectful. We don't need to talk about them as criminals. They're not. They're families that want a better life, and they're desperate to get here. What we need to do is make sure that we have a set of laws that we follow and that we go through with that. So, um, you know, I think that some things have been said that have been unfortunate and wrong. Um, but I think we also need to remember, especially for all of us, I, I say for Republicans because that's, that's who it is, tone and communication matters, and people matter, and we don't ever need to talk about this in a cold-hearted way. Um, and we need to remember the fact that... Be kinder than necessary. Be is that kinder than necessary. That's right. Let me open it up, if I may. Uh, I hope this spurred a few questions. I see a hand there in the middle, which will cause our microphone runners uh, agita. Just shout it out. You, you, Uh, Arizona land grant money, state treasurer opposing you, Governor. We're, uh, we're, we're, we've got a common sense plan that takes our permanent land endowment trust fund. Uh, it's at a, a value of $5.1 billion today. Uh, behind the, the permanent land trust fund is 8 million acres of state land with a present value of $70 billion. So I ran a proposition in 2012 called Proposition 118. It was successful at the ballot box. It protected the trust. It ensured that these dollars consistently and predictably went into K-12 education. Uh, this is a financially responsible plan. We're going to take it to the legislature, and I'm confident that we're going to be able to drive two billion additional dollars into K-12 education to benefit our children and our teachers without raising taxes. Sir, you were the one I had pointed to, so I'll let you go next. The lights are in my Thank eyes, you. so you'll Thank have you, to Walter. forgive me. Yeah. Um, I always enjoy coming here and listening to these successful governors and what they have to say. Governor McCurry, when you said uh, that people don't like gas taxes because they see actually how much is coming out of their pocket, I think that's a, a very important um, observation on your part. And one of the things that um, everybody, I'd like everybody to comment on is part of all the tax money that, that we wind up paying, so many of us see it going down the toilet. Um, so when we do see money that's, that's coming out of our pockets, like at the gas pump or um, for other things, we like to know that it's being used properly. And when taxes are, are coming out um, that, that are, are unseen, it's, it's very difficult. So um, if you'd like, we, I think it should be more, uh, more obvious where our tax money is coming from. If you guys would like to comment on that, I appreciate Well, that's one reason with transportation that I now have a formula which takes the politics of how we build our roads because it was so unpredictable. You know, you go down a highway and it goes from two lanes to four lanes back to two lanes and it had no rhyme or reason or connectivity and it was hurting our commerce and congestion and safety. So now we're very clear and we've basically taken the day to day politics out of decisions on infrastructure, which was a big, big issue. I did the same thing with bus lines as Mayor of Charlotte. The politicians used to always mess with bus lines, and it was never determined based upon where the ridership was. It was based upon where the politicians lived. So I took that same formula. The other thing is on the bonds that I hope to put on the ballot this November is in the bonds, we're telling the voters exactly where their money's going to go as opposed to saying, give us the $2.8 billion and then trust us. We'll let you know later. So I feel it's very, very important for leadership to tell the people exactly where we plan to spend the money and to tell them the vision 
of what that will do then for the state to make us more competitive against some of our other states. And Governor Fallon, you wanted to do a quick follow-up there? Absolutely. We have an eight-year transportation plan in the state of Oklahoma. We also prioritize what's the most important safety-wise, congestion-wise, commerce, and ease of traveling throughout our state. And we have even a five-year county road and bridge building program in our state. So we have a plan, we prioritize it, and, and getting back to the transparency issue, when I talked about performance and foreign budgeting, one of the things that we've done with our measurements and our goals is that we actually put that online for the taxpayers to be able to see. And so if you want to go and, and look at what our goals are, and then next year, because we just started this year, look to see how we performed and if we move the needle in the right direction, and something that we wanted to improve upon in our state, a taxpayer could see that because we publish it online. It's called okstatestat.ok.gov. Mm -hmm. Yeah, way back there. <laughs> Thanks, Walter. So I have a question about jobs. If you look at the cover of the Atlantic Magazine today, they talk about, what is it, a million jobs are gonna be lost due to technology, and how do we combat that? And at the Aspen Ideas Festival, there's actually a debate about this, and both sides agreed that this was going to have to be a political maneuver, that it's going to have to come from politicians to fight this battle, and I wanted to know what you guys thought about that and what your ideas were. Thank you. Nikki, I mean, Governor Haley. Sorry, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So you're saying that because we're being so sick. Okay, so that's what I thought. Okay. Which, by the way, not all of us agree with. Uh, yeah. Since the 1830s, people have been saying that, and it's been untrue but, ever since but then. But you know what but, I'll say is, look, yeah. we are seeing more and more technology, and I can tell you from the manufacturing sector, we're seeing more and more robots do things as opposed to people, mm -hmm. right? So I, but that's not a bad thing, because it creates different kinds of jobs. And so what I'll tell you is our focus needs to be very much on how do we train everyone? For example, in South Carolina, we now have when somebody goes into a welfare office, we don't sit there and, I mean, we do the paperwork to sign up the welfare, but they actually literally walk into an interview. We find out what they can do. We find out what their qualifications are. We find out what their skill set is. And then we turn around and we put them in a job. And we tell an employer that if you employ this person for eight weeks with a mentor, we will pay for it. And then afterwards, you decide if you want to keep it. We have taken 25,000 people off of welfare and put them to work by putting them in that interview process. Let me, uh, 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 the second thing we've done is now we just opened our first employment center in a prison. Now we're training in the prisons, but before they leave the, the fence, they're actually being trained. They're going through an interview process, and when they leave the Fence. they've got a job. They don't have to go look for one, they've got a job. So while you see jobs being taken away, I think the more important part is how do we get those people who feel like they can't lift up? How do we lift them up to get the jobs that are out there that we know we can train them, we can skill them, and we can put them into work? We're going to keep getting jobs. We just have to train people to fill the new jobs that we're starting to see happen. Let me go to uh, both Governor Ducey and Governor McCrory, both nodded. But I, I didn't want to be dismissive because it's a very good question that technology may not destroy jobs, but it disrupts jobs. It changes the nature. And one of the things technology has done is create a new economy where people sort of have gig work, they may be anything from Uber to, you know, consultants online, but it changes the whole social contract. So what are you all doing to prepare for a new technology and the new economy that comes with it? Well, the first thing I'd say that one of the great things about RGA is that we get to take each other's ideas and, and apply it. So this idea of welfare to work or employment centers inside our prisons is something that I saw here at, at RGA, and we're applying that in Arizona. So these people are trained. And I would challenge the premise of the question because I believe, it, just like I'm sure in the industrial revolution, they thought that that was putting farmers out of business. I think this technology is the next iteration of what has been the most innovative, creative economy in the history of the world. And we do think it's changing things. What we want to do is embrace it. What we've done in Arizona in a, in a short period of time, I came into office, took over uh, 35,000 uh, state employees, 42 agency heads, 220 boards and commissions. We had a guy at the Department of Weights and Measures who told us that his plan was that he was going to sting Uber and Lyft during the Super Bowl and shut them down. 
So we found a new director <laughs> at the Department of Weights and Measures. And wh what we did is they were, this was an uh, overly aggressive state bureaucrat who was taking regulations written for taxi cabs and applying it to a whole new idea, an innovation called ride sharing, which is really changing our economy in so many ways. So we do believe the economy's changing in Arizona. We want to embrace it by improving our tax code and regulatory environment. Uh, so I, I think that it's going to be an exciting time. I think it can go to help with some of the congestion because not only are we going to have ride sharing, but I believe we're going to have driverless cars a lot more quickly uh, than many people believe we are still several years out to be certain, but I think this technology is gonna improve our economy and what we wanna make sure, whether it's through K-12 or community colleges or people that are coming out of corrections or welfare, that they have a skill set so that they can be productive in this economy. Uh, Governor, okay, I'm gonna let you go ahead, but Just I wanna also put a question to you that you can add on, which is what policy changes, to get to exactly what the questioner was asking, political changes have to be made if we move to a gig economy where people aren't joining a corporation at age 20 and retiring at age 65 with pensions, disability, health care, all those things. How do we change policies to accommodate a new economy based more on gig labor than on joining a corporation your whole life? Well, one, one response that we have control over as governors is we have to make academia more flexible and adaptable to this new economy. We're still uh, in K through 12 education, even some community colleges and four-year colleges, we're, we're living in the past century. And we need to adapt academia to what the changing markets are because one of the great challenges this nation has right now, we have a major skills gap. In fact, how we beat each other for jobs is to show the new employer we can find the skills or train the people right on the job site to get you the skill set necessary to uh, keep your business intact. And, and uh, so academia right now, for example, we need to put more emphasis on certification in certain areas as opposed to degrees. Uh, and I have a nephew, for example, right now, instead of going through a two-year MBA program, he's going through a one-year MBA program because the new generation wants things quicker, more efficiently. We're going to have to have a lot more online training. The Western Governors Universities, which I'd like to adapt to, to North Carolina, which some of my universities are fighting because it's seen as competition. I think competition in education is extremely good. And uh, the military right now, we think we have both North and South Carolina have huge military bases. We have, of course, Fort Bragg. We want to uh, welcome home the men and women coming home from Afghanistan and Iraq. And one of the ways we can do that is get them a job. But instead of, for example, requiring a medical person coming from home from Afghanistan and Iraq to go through all these courses which they could test out of in a day because they've been doing it for years, let them go ahead and test out of it as opposed to going through the academic bureaucracy which we've had for many decades. So we have to adapt our academia and academia through our funding policies, and that's the, that's the carrot and the stick, is don't reward them just by how many people go into the school, but how many people graduate and get a job? And that's the way our funding element's gonna be in the future. Uh, yeah, let me, yes, right there if you want. Whoops, sorry, you should have grabbed the mic when it went uh, by. Uh, elephant, elephant in the room, 2016, thoughts on that and Donald Trump? 2016. Actually, I, I doubt we'll be able to get you to endorse unless you really want to, but what are you looking for in a president for 2016 from your party? If I can make it that way. Well, there are a lot of people running. Mm -hmm. The good part about that is we're going to get a lot of ideas and a lot of debate. And from the Republican side, I think we have a diverse, wide field of candidates, a deep field of candidates, which I think is exciting. And I also think that I think what the American people are looking for is someone with a vision, someone with a plan, someone, as we heard a pollster talk about earlier today, someone who cares about what they care about. There's an old saying that I've always lived by politically that says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if someone thinks that a political figure doesn't care about their family, about their jobs, about some type of challenge they may have, about their public safety, about education, whatever it might be, then they're probably not going to support that person. But even if they may not be the most intellectual person, mm -hmm. 
but they believe they care about the issues that are important to their family, they'll probably support that person. So I think people are, are going to be looking at all the candidates, looking at the issues, listening. There's a wide range of opinions and choices that are going to be out there this, this uh, next election cycle. You might want to be a little bit more pointed on a, uh, what you want. I'll go out on the limb. I predict a current or former governor. <laughs> and the reason why is because I think that's been lacking uh, for the past eight years, is that we didn't have that's someone with executive leadership who had put a team together, who also had to be concerned about operations of government. Most people forget that one of our major jobs is the operation and execution not just developing policy, but developing a vision and then executing that policy. And that's the experience that comes out of mayor's offices and governor's offices. And I think that's the skill set that we need, along with some private sector experiences. No doubt a, a welcome addition to that experience. Well, I can name four out of the 16 that fa fall into that category. But maybe... Is that right? Okay, I, maybe my math was a little. I'm putting John Kasich in there too. I know a good right? vice presidential candidate that's Nikki Haley? next door. <laughs> I want her out of South Carolina. I want her in Washington. It's a very selfish reason. But do you know that? I will always haunt you, Pat. I will always haunt you. But do you know that the vice president of the United States, Governor McCrory, actually can channel jobs to whatever state she wants? Damn you, Nikki. <laughs> yeah. This is why Delaware has so many jobs now. So Let can me go. we let's shift a little bit um, because I want to go back to, to what his question was. First of all, we've got, I think, now 17 candidates, and most of them are fantastic. I mean, they really are. I think that they're, I see a lot of leadership skills. I see a lot that can come to the table. What I am looking for is I want to see how they handle a debate. I want to hear, it's got to be more than just words. I want action. I want results. I want a fighter, but I don't want, that's, want one that's going to fight each other. I want them to fight for the people. And that's the difference. And when you asked about Mr. Trump, and, and, and Mr. Trump is, has been a supporter of mine, and I consider him a friend, but I'm disappointed in him because what he has done is attacked everybody personally. That's not what we're looking for in a president. What we're looking for is somebody that brings people together. And so having said that, I think it's going to be a fantastic um, debate. It, watching them handle the pressure of the media is going to be very interesting. And seeing how they go into rooms that are uncomfortable to go, which is, you know, for a Republican, I don't want to see you just going into GOP rooms. I want to see you going and talking to Indian Americans. I want to see you talking to the Jewish community. I want to see you talking to the Latinos. And I want you to listen, and I want to know what you're going to do for everybody, because that's what it's going to take for a Republican to win the White House. Yeah. Wait, in the middle back there, yes, hand up, yeah. We'll do a, Fred, is this there will some be, time limit you need, or? This is a very okay. brief question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all of you governors, have spoken about the pervasiveness of drug addiction in your states. <clears throat> Can you comment briefly on the regulation of cannabis moving forward? Regulation, I'm sorry, I missed it. Oh, uh, yeah, marijuana, got it, sorry. <laughs> I'm a previous generation, I don't know what cannabis is. Don't all leap, okay, yeah, Governor I, Haley. No, I just, I told Pat to stay away from the brownies today. Yeah. So I was, um, you know, I will tell I you. I thought it was mint ice cream last <laughs> night. I, what I will tell you is all of the governors have watched um, what has happened. And, and the governor of Colorado actually gave us all a warning, which I appreciated, which he said, wait. He said because they were seeing a lot of unforeseen problems that they didn't know they were going to have. And it was very helpful to all of us, which was learn from us on what to do and what not to do. So that, first of all, is helpful. In South Carolina, we have passed a medicinal marijuana bill because we saw that there are needs for certain treatments where it's especially helpful for children and treatments like that. And I think it's going to continue to be a conversation. So in South Carolina, it's still along the medicinal lines that we're talking about it. It hasn't gone any further than that. And I think for me as a governor of South Carolina, I want to continue to watch these other states. I know that during Halloween, they had problem with edibles and children and things like that so we just want to make sure we're being smart about it as we go forward. Yeah, I will say our governor has here 
has really worked hard on that and done a good job even at Halloween. Governor Ducey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I've said, uh, as, as the son of a cop and the father of three young sons, uh, it just doesn't strike me as a, a very good idea. I, I, I've also said to my more freedom-loving friends, uh, what's the hurry? Uh, we have two states that have already done this. Why don't we sit back and, and watch the experiment and see how it goes? And I was uh, interested to see, and I think it was actually Governor Brown of California that said uh, no country or state made itself any stronger by being stoned. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was instructive. I won't, I won't go there. Um, the, only, the only thing I would say... Uh, <laughs> There's a skills gap in North, Car in, in North Carolina and throughout this country. We need people to learn and to gain skills. This does not help that cause. And we do not know the impact on mental health in the long term and on the human brain. And I think we're glorifying uh, this drug too much without knowing the real long-term impact, especially on kids' brains, which is what we need yes, for sir. the future. All right. I'll get you next. The, here and then the... Yeah. Person who missed the mic on the last run. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, just wanted to ask, one of the huge issues this month has been the Steinle murder in, in San Francisco and the sanctuary policy discussion that's happening. And I was wondering if, if you have sanctuary cities or jurisdictions in your states and if there's anything you can do about that as, as governor. Why don't we let Governor Ducey take it since you're on the front line. Well. Uh, you, you know, I think all of our hearts go out to this family and this situation. And I think there's many people that would say, I, I shouldn't say that. If anyone that's saying that this is a non-issue or that this just happened in, in California and the media decided to, to cover this, I will tell you in the state of Arizona, we have had 5,000 uh, illegal individuals arrested in the last four years that have been released while awaiting deportation. Of those 5,000, there's been 147 significant crimes committed during that time. So I'm not a fan of this idea of, of a sanctuary that would stop police officers from enforcing the law. Um, I think Governor Haley said it very well. We are a nation of immigrants. We will legally let one million people into this country this year. At the same time, we are a nation of laws. And as a governor, your first charge is for the public safety of your citizens and your state. And that's something we're going to continue to focus on in Arizona. Yes, sir. Right here. Gary Shapiro, the Consumer Electronics Association. Two brief questions. Uh, how do you feel about Airbnb, Uber, Lyft? Uh, are you doing anything to make the sharing economy legal in your state, which is what a lot of your consumers want, number one? And number two, do any of you plan to hold any events or attend any events at Trump hotels? You know, we, we just passed a... We just passed legislation in South Carolina that would allow Uber to be a competitive part of our state. Um, we had our, um, my public service commission was easily taken by the taxi drivers and tried to stop it. We quickly told them they needed to change their ways. They did. We passed legislation quickly. And now there are Uber drivers all over South Carolina. And so the quality and the competition is, is very good. And Airbnb, has that been a tougher issue? I'm sorry? Airbnb. No. Now, okay. Sorry, Governor. We love the sharing economy. We uh, are going to embrace it. We love Airbnb. I talked about lifting the regulations on Uber and Lyft, and I think the states that do this, just like the states that, that lower taxes or lighten regulation, are going to be more competitive and grow their economies and create more jobs and have a higher quality of life for their citizens. So we're certainly going to, going to continue to embrace that in Arizona. Does anybody want to take the Trump part of the question we're about... Agreement. Whether or not, you know, there should be some sanctions against what he said. I Governor? We're allowed freedom of speech. I disagree with what he says, but we're, if we start getting into disagreeing with what people say politically, 
that's the great thing about our country is you can say what you want politically, even when we disagree with it, but no, then but other business people would be harmed, and I, I just think that's taken a step too far. Governor Haley. It's wrong. It's wrong. What he's, you know, I, freedom of speech, I will always fight for freedom of speech, but he is creating a very combative tone in a time where we really need to be able to vet our candidates, and every day I feel like I'm hearing Mr. Trump attack another person personally. That's not what we need in a presidential race, not in a Democratic primary, not in a Republican primary, or not in this presidential primary. By the way, I agree with that, but I just don't think we ought to boycott businesses or we're going to, that's yeah. opening up a whole nother window. That's what I was referring to there. Uh, there's a gentleman in the way back for us, yeah. Yeah. I wrote down my question because I wanted to, I didn't want to upset people. And I tried to do it and make the question in the least upsetting way. I understand the issues discussed here, and I congratulate you for your success, all four of you. However, the nuclear missile that will be fired in 10 to 15 years will not be accurate enough to differentiate between blue states and red states. My question to you is what is your plan to minimize casualties in your states if it is hit? I you win, Governor Fallon. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm very concerned about the negotiations going on with Iran. First of all, there's nothing more important to the United States than national security and protecting our states and our nation from those who want to cause us harm. And there are so many people around the world that don't love what we love, our freedom and our liberty, our religious freedom, our freedom of speech, freedom to assemble, our free enterprise system, and there are those who want to bring us down. And so protecting our nation, having a strong president that will make sure we get the policies right, and Congress being able to have a voice and whatever type of negotiations we might be having with other foreign countries is essential so that we can have a true representative voice of the people of America. But protecting our national security is probably the most important thing we need to be doing right now, especially with terrorism, Islamic states, and those who just don't like America. A woman in the back there. I'm, I'm trying to get both sides in. And I think... Thank you, Governors. Um, I have a question sort of on a different uh, strain. With the Republican Party being criticized in recent years for its lack of diversity and position on social issues, such as gay marriage and women's reproductive rights, do you see the evol uh, party evolving to address these concerns, and how do you think that will change in your state? Good question. I mean, I'll take it. Um, yeah. I'll, 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 let you, I'll let you both speak, obviously. Did you want, go ahead. Hmm. Well, I'll just say one thing we have to do as uh, Republicans, and I expect the Democrats to do the same thing, is respect the rule of law. I vetoed, uh, I happen to disagree with gay marriage, but when the Supreme Court ruled on it, we had a piece of legislation which uh, gave a pass to register of deeds from doing the actual marriage. And I firmly believe if you're, you swear to uphold the Constitution of not only of your state, but of the United States of America, there should not be an asterisk next to that. Sadly, my veto was overridden. By the way, I feel the same way about sanctuary cities. I di strongly disagree with sanctuary cities because we have police officers in each of our cities who swear an oath not only to the Constitution of their state, but to the Constitution of the United States. So it's our job to enforce the laws of our states and of the United States, and there should be no exceptions by the president or by a governor or by a police officer or by a mayor. And that applies to the social issues also, whether we agree or disagree. I'm getting the signal to end, but I'm going to let, if any of you have a final word, but I'm also going to put Governor Ducey on the spot, which is, what did you learn from the Rodell Fellowship at the Aspen Institute that's helped you in government? Getting a plug in for our institute. Well, I, I learned that there were a lot of wonderful people on the other side of the aisle, and we had some great discussions. And I uh, understood that uh, what they want to get done comes with with good intentions. Oftentimes, they'll have a different worldview, and the setting that you provide here 
especially in those, those classrooms and the, the proctors that you have, has been a great experience. So I made a lot of new friends on the Republican side, but also on the Democrat side. And if I would have been asked the question about our next president, I would have wanted to see a leader that can, br that can lead the country and bring it together. We've both seen presidents of both parties in our lifetime that have been able to do that. There's no reason we shouldn't expect that going forward. Um, I'll let each of you address that. Just so people know, the Rodell program is something that takes young, up-and-coming political leaders, 12 of each party, and they work together. And so I'm going to use that as a theme for the other three of you, what Governor Ducey said, which is what can we do to reduce the poisonous part of the partisanship that seems to have crept into our nation in the past two decades? Well, I personally think people are tired of the fighting. They just want to see people solve their problems. And that's one of the beauties of being a governor of a state is we don't have the luxury of going to Congress and doing nothing. We have to solve problems because we're held accountable if we don't. We don't win re-election. And so we have the ability to be able to propose how do we fix welfare, how do we fix education, how do we address skills gaps, how do we address transportation issues, how do we make sure our cities are safe, whether it's uh, looking at, at uh, CBD oil for seizures, whatever it might be, or, or substance abuse issues, that's what governors do. And so I think one of the strengths of our nation is that we have governors, and whichever party it might be, that can offer solutions to problems that I think Congress can learn from and I wish Congress would take more action to address specific problems that is facing America right now. Governor McCrory. You know, my dad was a small town city council member in Worthington, Ohio, before he moved the family to North Carolina in 1966. And I borrow a phrase from him often in leadership, and that is, we must walk the fine line between continuing our economic prosperity while also protecting the quality of life, which bring many of us here, including to Aspen. And I think that's the fine line that we're all walking in leadership, is we have to continue economic prosperity, but we also have to protect that quality of life. And the way we do that is having dialogue like this, being problem solvers, and also creating a vision on what we want our cities and towns and states and our nation to look like in the next 50 years. And that's why I go back to the very beginning, Eisenhower presented a plan which we're still feeling the positive impact in 2015. And that's the way we need to be thinking as leaders, both in the private sector and the public sector. It's too much of us are thinking about the next quarter results or the next election in politics. And I think what people are looking for is, how are we gonna help our children and grandchildren? And be very honest with the um, impact of what those strategies and decisions we're gonna implement are, and be very honest. Governor Haley, final words. You know, I, I think that people spend a lot of time about what we disagree on, and we're going to disagree on things. That's what we do. Republicans believe one way, de Democrats believe another, and I think um, what we need to remember is words don't matter. Actions do. But let's look at some actions. In, in South Carolina, I'll give you an example. We wanted to change education. We no longer educate children based on where they're born and raised. We now educate children based on the fact that they deserve a good education. So we now give more money for children in poverty. We've put reading coaches in all the districts. We now have technology in all the districts that couldn't afford it. We're no longer passing kids out of the third grade that can't read. That wasn't Republican or Democrat. That was about our future. That was about kids. When we went and we put these employment offices in prisons, and we're doing these training programs to, to train people so that we can lift them up or get them from welfare to work. That wasn't Republican or Democrat. That was lifting people up. And what we have to remember is there are a lot of things that affect governors and presidents. Our job is to act and do what's in the best interest of all people. Some are going to be debate. There's going to be a lot of debate, and we can do that. But in, there are a lot more things that we will agree on if we step in each other's shoes and just understand where they're coming from than not. So I think that you know what we need to see is we do need to see some more civility, but we also need to make sure there's always accountability. And between the two of those, we can find promise at the end of the day. Well, thank you all very much. We will have the uh, Democratic governors in a week. And I'm sure they'll agree on one thing, is that governors know how to solve problems, not create it. It's been a great pleasure having all four of you here. 
Thank you very much.